So I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk with Augustine Hardley, um, our soloist, our recital soloist with Orion Weiss coming up very soon. Augustine, uh, good morning. Nice to see you. Hi, good morning. Um, uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about the program that you're bringing to St. Paul. Uh, we're excited to have you back. Um, can you tell us a bit about, about the program, about how you select these works, how you put a program together? Because I know you put a lot of thought into how things fit. Uh, yes. Well, there's a lot of considerations when making a program, and some of the considerations are practical. They have to do with what pieces, um, what other pieces am I, well, what pieces am I playing at other, in other concerts? And other considerations are about how the pieces fit together, relationships they have with one another, um, and now, in this case, the Kreutzer Sonata, I think, was probably the was probably the first idea um, that formed for the for the for the programs this fall with with Orion Weiss because we really wanted wanted to play this piece and we love this piece and it's incredibly exciting to play that together. So that was we pretty pretty quickly settled on that's going to be the second half because it kind of um, takes up a half of a concert and just is such a strong, massive, intense work. Um, and then, um, uh, well, the concert starts with Stravinsky uh, suite after themes, fragments, um, uh, and pieces by Pergolesi, which is actually the same piece as a piece called Suite Italienne. Um, so most people know it as Suite Italienne, but it's a different arrangement. This one is, this is the arrangement by Stravinsky himself, but then usually people play the so-called Suite Italienne, which was made by Samuel Dushkin and is a little bit, uh, I would say, de stravinsky -fied. Like, <laughs> Dushkin like, took out some of the quirky stuff and also made it easier and a bit simpler. And I feel like this original version is more exciting. Um, more funny also. I mean, some of these jokes are jokes that are just for us musicians when we're, because there are moments where um, it sounds a bit like um, um, like an orchestra where the basses get off, uh, they lose their way kind of and, and get off and then half of them try to get back on but they don't manage to. They're like little things that happen like that. But there's a general kind of um, joy in this, in this music and in these kinds of, um, uh, sudden surprises and, uh, you know, it sounds like Baroque music, but suddenly you have little surprises and you're like, whoa, no, that's, it's, we're actually listening to Stravinsky. So Stravinsky, uh, he once said um, that, you know, bad composers borrow ideas, but great composers steal them. <laughs> and this is a very Stravinsky thing to say. He, he, he did write a lot of music where he would really just take themes by other composers and work with them. And um, the Suite Italienne is, um, is one of those, those works. It's taken from the ballet um, Pulcinella. And Pergolesi was a Baroque composer um, who, who died quite young and it's, uh, you know, not too well known, but he wrote, but he did have wonderful musical ideas. And I think through this piece, we really get to experience um, Pergolesi's music and also Stravinsky kind of paying homage to him and poking fun at the at the Baroque style in some ways and it's just a lot of yeah it's just a lot of fun um, so that's uh, so that was going to open the program mm -hmm. and it's just a very uh, it's a very joyful piece of music it's actually among the first pieces of music that I played as a child in the other version the Sweet Italienne and I remember as a child I just loved Stravinsky because it was so spiky somehow. Um, <laughs> and I think you've recorded it, right? I did record this, yeah, about 10 years ago. Okay, that long. Uh, yeah. And then the um, second work on the program is going to be a uh, solo violin by a composer called Coleridge Taylor Perkinson, who was um, an African American composer who just died maybe 15 years ago. Or something like that, and um, he wrote this this work in the seventies. It's called Blues Forms, and um, it's inspired by blues, but it's it's not straight up blues. Um, but there you can you can you can feel a lot of the influences of the of the of the blues harmonies and gestures, um, and I find it's 
really effectively written for the violin. Um, he, he also he played the violin himself, and you can tell how the music kind of um, naturally develops from the instrument. In, it reminds me a little bit of Eugène Isai, who's whose music also is clearly composed on the instrument. I, I've, I've, I really enjoy um, Perkinson's solo violin music and, um, and this piece in particular. So I, I think it'll be a lot of fun. And this actually, in a, in a way, creates a bridge to uh, uh, the Ravel sonata for violin and piano. In, the, in this particular piece, Ravel has a lot of um, jazz influences. Um, and the second movement is called blues. Um, and uh, this time viewed through the lens of this classical French composer, but he, Ravel was always eager to find inspiration in, well, anywhere really, but you, you can find just, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess um, French composers of his time were in general quite open to just taking ideas and, and inspiration from other cultures and from other styles of music. And uh, that's why we're available so much music that's Spanish or that's uh, somehow uh, exotic, and then pieces that have jazz influence like this one. Um, so that's, uh, and that's the first half. Well, and then the second half is the Kreutzer Sonata, which is going to be the, it, it, in a way, it's almost like after intermission, we sort of start over with a very different work. Yeah. Fabulous. So um, Stravinsky, Ravel, and Beethoven are all um, familiar composer names uh, to, to, to the vast majority of us. But probably Coleridge Taylor Perkinson um, is new to some. And, and I, I was just going to observe that the classical music world over the last three, five uh, years has really taken much more interest and, um, and, and really turned a spotlight onto music by African-American composers who um, who, who were maybe a little bit ignored before. And I just, I wondered whether you had any, I wonder when you discovered this piece and, and fallen in love with it and whether you had any thoughts on um, you know, the, the, the new commitment in the classical music world to, uh, to discovering works that were maybe uh, ignored or, or, or not really visible mm -hmm. in the past. Well, I think in the, in the classical music world, we have a general, tendency to ignore works and and uh, I think need to grow the repertoire, repertoire just sort of generally. So I think every every few years there is a moment when something kind of is rediscovered. And I think right now is um, was a, a point um, when, yes, music by black composers kind of uh, when, um, was kind of is kind of going more into the into the repertoire, and and some some works are finding the place that they should have. You know, in the violin world, violinists we always like play what everyone else is playing. So there's like a bunch of sheep. So uh, so that just the fact that you never see anyone else play this means well, then the students don't learn it either, and you know everyone just plays basically what they see other people play, and there there have been. There have been moments before in the past 50 years where certain violinists suddenly ch start championing something and then it actually starts being played more, you know, like when Guidon Kramer suddenly champions Arvo Pert or, you know, the moments when when things, when the repertoire changes a bit and I think that needs to, uh, that needs to happen regularly. So last year, um, when there was a lot of discussion, well, may maybe we should um, Look at parts of the repertoire that have been neglected, and and so then I looked through a lot of music um, by black composers, and I found some things that really spoke to me. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I believe in programming something just um, to check some sort of box. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to find something that really, that I felt that I I really really want to play, and that I can somehow that speaks to me that I can make this make a piece come alive mm -hmm. and uh yeah and there were some composers that i was really blown away by and uh and perkinson was one of them i just had the best time learning his music and so now i'm actually playing it quite a lot there's another work of his um which is a shorter work called louisiana blues strut which i often play as an encore um this year and it's i find it's just 
one of the most effective encores I think I've ever <laughs> played because it's uh, somehow uh, like loosens it loosens the audience and uh, up at the end of a serious concert and it's uh, really wonderfully written and so I th I think this is a yeah he is a composer who who wrote some who wrote a number of works that I think should be um, part of the repertoire since we since I mean, he was not unknown or obscure. His music was published. It's not like I discovered it in some attic or something. No, it was it, it was out there, but just um, few people were looking at it, and now suddenly everyone's looking at this um, repertoire. And I think some some things will definitely stay permanently in the Berlin repertoire. Yeah. That's great. Well, we will hopefully applaud strongly enough that we uh, we earn the, the encore when when, when you're here. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I wanted just to ask you a little bit about um, working with Orion. Um, Orion Weiss, known to our audience as well, he's been to St. Paul a couple of times, as 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 have you. Um, when you when you find a recital partner, um, I, I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about you know, how that works. Why, why, why do you, why do you choose one another? Because, um, and, and, and what is it about his playing that, that makes you want, want to, want to do, to play a recital with him, a recital tour? Well, I first met Orion, I think, over 10 years ago, and uh, we played chamber music once in a while. We would s see each other at different festivals, and we always, uh, got along great and somehow I think thought along the same lines when we played when we played music and we're kind of on the same page musically and as a result it felt really easy to to play together and to make music together and um, he's also a great pianist uh, I mean there's nothing he can't do uh, apparently so uh, a piece like the Kreuzer Sonata in particular uh, when uh, I knew I was playing with Orion I said oh that's you know, he, he could really just play the hell out of the chords of sonata. So that was, that was, uh, of course, that's uh, incredibly exciting too. And it is actually, when you're not just playing one concert, but when you're playing a number of concerts, like a tour, and you travel together, it's actually important that you also, that you're also friends and that you get a, get along. Because traveling on a, on a tour of concerts is actually quite hard. There are many moments that are pretty annoying uh, you know when you're waiting for a flight or you're stuck in traffic or you know things like that <laughs> and um, it's just uh, touring touring with the Rhine is always a lot of fun as well so I'm yeah. always looking forward to our to our concerts uh, as are we um, maybe just one 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 last question um, uh, I'm wondering whether there's you're back on the road now. I think you said that you, were, you had a concert last night in, in the States. And um, I'm wondering how uh, the, the break that uh, in, in your performance life uh, because of COVID, I'm wondering how, whether there are any things that have changed the way you approach going about um, performing uh, now, now that you've, uh, you've had to endure that long break from not being in front of an audience. Yes. Um... Well, I think I was lucky because I did have have a chance at various points in the pandemic to play for audiences um, in last fall in Europe and then also in a couple of moments in the spring where I was in, in, a, in places where they were holding concerts just with fewer people and, and I had things to do. But I think that the, I, well, of course I had um, initially maybe six months of just sitting at home and well, it forced me to kind of um, focus on other things and create new projects. Rather, instead of just looking at the concerts that are getting canceled, I um, I uh, made a recording of the sonatas and partitas by Bach and mm -hmm. um, learned a lot of new repertoire and um, just kind of refocused in a way. And I think what's different now when I return um, is that I think, and I think this is the same for many musicians, we don't take anything for granted. You know, it used to be just normal that you walk on stage and there's, there's you know, a thousand people in front of you. Uh, that used to feel normal. And I think now we realize that's actually very, very special and every performance uh, 
after having that long uh, dry period, so to speak, just feels very uh, special uh, to play for people. Um, everyone realized how much, well, how much better a live performance is from a video. And also, so just that, that just being in the same room with a performer is a totally different experience. But for us performers, it's also very different to play with when people are listening in the same room than if we just play for a camera. And I think this, uh, I think the relationships between um, us musicians and the, and the listeners, I think we're uh, even closer, closer now when concerts are happening. And uh, so I've enjoyed every, every concert that happens now, I enjoy, uh, just, I enjoy myself immensely. Wonderful. Well, I think, yeah, uh, I can speak on behalf of our audience that I think it's the same from the audience perspective that now um, uh, after that long break, it's it's just a thrill to hear live music and be in the same space as performance. So we're thrilled that you're coming soon to Minnesota. Me too. And I can't wait to see you and hear you perform. So thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you so much. I can't wait, can't wait to come back to St. Paul. Great. Thank you.